Hey, Seminole State family. It is Nicole from the library. Oop, I got some feedback here. I hate technical difficulties. Hey, Seminole State family. This is Nicole from the library. Welcome to our Seed for Thought Seed Library reopening uh, program today. We are so excited to be able to start sharing um, a whole host of programming this fall, uh, really mining from the valuable insight and wisdom and experience from our community members, our faculty, staff, and students. And this is one such great program. So today um, we have Bob Howard uh, from the, and let me make sure I say it correctly, Bob Howard of the University of Florida IFAS Extension which is actually located nearby the Sanford Lake Mary campus here. Um, it is a partnership between the University of Florida, which also is a partner of Seminole State College, and um, the Seminole County. And they do like local specific like gardening and um, environmental initiatives. Um, and then they also do like statewide regional type information that helps with whether it's gardening or maintaining landscapes, um, uh, all those environmental type things. Um, our wonderful, the library's own, Linda Cole, a library coordinator, and also Carly Mayer, uh, one of the reference and instruction librarians who's based out of the Oviedo campus, have so graciously offered their expertise as they are both accomplished gardeners um, in putting together this program. And part of, with Bob, he is presenting an intro to gardening class. So if you are interested, you think, oh, I should try it. I should do it. I should just even find out if I if I want to go ahead with it because gardening is quite a big undertaking take it from me I've tried it I don't know if you have um, I've tried and failed but Carly has promised um, in the materials that go along with this program that even if you have a black thumb they can uh, help you turn that around um, so there's the intro to gardening class but then there's also a seed library it's called the seed for thought seed library that is physically located in the Sanford Lake Mary campus library on the first floor and we're gonna do a quick video tour. We're gonna go down there um, at the end of the hour. And you are welcome to come and take seeds um, and use your discretion as you know, the library is open to others, so don't take too many, uh, but now is the time to plant, okay? As you'll find out probably from Bob here in a few minutes when the presentation gets going and we show that in this stream. Um, you can come and take a, some seeds, plant them, Use the LibGuide, which I will provide links to the LibGuide to help you with the gardening. Okay, this was produced by Carly and Linda. Um, use the LibGuide to help you through the gardening process. And then at harvest time, the idea is that you bring seeds back to the library and put them in um, the seed library cabinet. Or if you buy a pack of seeds and you don't need them all, please come into the Sanford Lake Mary Library and donate them to the seed library. Now, I do want to um, quickly uh, show you before they, oh, is it getting started? Not quite yet. I do want to quickly plug, uh, oh, where is it? Okay. Since you're here today, um, I do want to quickly plug on, um, there's a follow-up physical event on October 30th. Uh, so you might want to definitely check that out. It is in Raider Connect. So I want to make sure that everyone knows about that um, at this time. And they're probably ready to get started pretty soon. So Bob and Carly and Linda are in the second floor instruction lab here at the Sanford Lake Mary Library. And he's going to go through a PowerPoint presentation of the intro to gardening. Oh, and I do want to give a big shout out to two we have a couple minutes bob sat back down all right i'm going to move that and i do want to give a shout out to the environmental initiative clubs there's one based at sanford lake mary and at oviedo here let me share this with you all right stop sharing share again We'll do screen two. This will work. <laughs> then I can pop between. Okay. Environmental Initiative Club. 
I'm sorry, it's just called Environmental Initiative at Sanford Lake Mary and then Oviedo Oaks Environmental Initiative Club at Oviedo and they have their own um, chapters. And so if you wanna check out um, all other types of activities and goings ons that have to do with gardening and also in conjunction with the Seed for Thought Library, please check out Radar Connect um, for the Sanford Lake Mary and the Oviedo um, Environmental Initiatives. Radar Connect for that. And of course, this is our event today. And also the um, UF IFAS extension, they have a website. So if you are curious about anything further that Bob talks about today, just know that um, you can check out this website and here's the lib guide that Carly's created. Once again, I am gonna put links to these resources in the description box, but also while they're presenting, I'm gonna go ahead and put that in the comments box here in the stream so that if you wanna access it uh, very quickly, you can do that. Okay, and they ought to be um, getting started rather shortly. So I am going to um, just go ahead and hang tight for that. All right, let's put up a little banner. Y'all for coming. Uh, we love to do these outreaches, particularly uh, catching you at an early age. Uh, I've been a gardener all my life and gotten more interested in, of course, now that I'm retired and got involved in the, the uh, Master Gardener program. Which now it's not advanced. There we go. Uh, so the Extension Office, it's, as she said, is just around the corner. Uh, we have in person and online classes. Uh, we have a number of uh, resident agents that are employees both of Seminole County and the University of Florida, uh, IPIS, which is the Institute for Food and Agricultural Sciences. Um, uh, we have uh, the Master Gardener Program, of course, which is we have about 80 or 90 of us. Uh, we have a new class starting up uh, pretty soon. I have a handout for any of those of you that are interested. We have a meet and greet uh, orientation uh, on the 8th of September. Uh, certainly can take away answer questions about that. Uh, our, one of our biggest outreach things is we have a help desk. Uh, it's manned uh, Monday through Friday, uh, and it's Master Gardeners there answering any sort of questions from uh, uh, either from email or phone, or you can drop by with uh, plants and questions and help you with any aspect of work. Uh, we also do mobile help desks. We're at the uh, Vito Lowe's on the first Saturday of every month, 10 to, 12, uh, 10 to 2, and the Sanford Lowe's on the second Saturday looking to expand to uh, the lows, thinking long or some things like that as well. Um, we do soil testing on site. We do pH soil testing for $2. You can just drop a sample off any time. Uh, we have a range of publications. Uh, we do uh, public speaking like this. Uh, we have 4-H and other outreach uh, sort of things. We have um, uh, cooperative arrangements with a couple of uh, nonprofits for 
uh, therapeutic gardening. We have therapeutic gardens in a couple of hospitals. We do gardens with uh, schools and community gardens. We help you set up. So if you're interested, uh, we'll talk about that a little later too. And a newsletter, which we can sign up for. So this is this is my main interest. I do speaking, but my principal interest is the help desk. Uh, it's a really great opportunity. And if you're a master gardener or uh, decide to become a master gardener, you'll you know have a little bit of experience with that. But please give us a call anytime as you if you get the seeds here uh, and you have questions about it. More than happy to, to help you with uh, getting the garden started, whether it's a single container or an in-ground place or anything you like. So here's what we're going to talk about cover today. Uh, I'm retired Army, and we always were told, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and tell them what you told them. So we're going to emphasize these sort of things as we go along. The first thing is really to have reasonable expectations. Getting started in gardening, if you haven't done it before, can be a challenge. So we encourage you to start small, and you know, even in a single container, you can learn a lot. Uh, they're planting the first tomato or, or whatever. Uh, picking the location is critical. We'll talk about that. Uh, talk about our seasons, how to select the crop, and the variety of the vegetables you want to do. How to manage the soil and plant nutrition from you know establishing that, that the container or, or in ground planting uh, to uh, fertilization. Um, Picking your seeds and the transplants, how to, how to pick one that's it's good quality. Uh, irrigation, of course, uh, very key. And uh, integrated pest management, that's our overall concept of how to use the lowest uh, toxicity, uh, lowest damaging sort of approach to handling your pests uh, if, if you can. And alternative garden, we're going to spend a lot of time uh, with uh, containers and some hydroponic stuff as well. And then I'll show you some resources. Okay, reasonable expectations, experience level. If you've never gardened before, uh, it can be a little intimidating and a little frustrating. I know uh, from talking to our sponsors that the, the seed efforts before maybe didn't go as, as well as, as uh, planned. Some people had frustrations because their seeds didn't sprout or they didn't last. I promise. We can help you an awful lot with that. But to, uh, taking the time to look at uh, what you have to work with is really important. Space available, uh, some of us like myself, I live in a nature way. Uh, a lot of you are, of course, not at the point of home ownership, but uh, you know, the time will come. If you're in an apartment, uh, you know, you may have a restrictions on something that, you know, what you're doing on your balcony, uh, that sort of thing. So consider the space that you have, the time that you have, because it can be intensive. Uh, materials that are, that are available, how much money can you spend? Uh, what do you have already? There's a lot of found, uh, objects or things that you can do, and I'll show you some examples later on uh, in the presentation. Uh, what's your favorite vegetable to eat? You know, don't grow uh, okra if you hate the taste of okra. You know, pick something that you like and it's easy, and we can help you with that as well. Um, budget, you talked about, are you going to just go for current consumption, or are you going to look to, to make an extension, a substantial crop uh, enough to can and preserve for later? Um, and why exactly do you want this? Is this a hobby? I mean, to me, it's a great stress reliever. This is my getaway. I get out. I like to get my fingers in the dirt. And, and that's a way to relax and relieve stress. And that's me on the, on the side, though, there. I really like low impact, low effort gardening. And there's a lot of ways that you can lower the impact of what you have to do. And really, this is me, too. I mean, the first time you grow a tomato plant, and pick that tomato, and there is just nothing like it. If you've never eaten a homegrown tomato, there is nothing to compare with it. It is just that. So picking a, a garden location has to be convenient. Now, mostly, you're going to be looking at uh, you know a container garden on your on your patio or, or balcony in your apartment or wherever, uh, but it really needs to be uh, convenient. If you're doing in ground or a raised bed, you have to have well-drained soil. You want to be close to water. You don't want to have to be hand watering everything if you if you don't have to. Of course, that's always an option. And this is one that really is critical. You need six hours of sunlight. So if you're in an apartment and your balcony is, is on the north side of your of your house, you're not gonna have great luck with vegetable gardens. But we have some options of those plants that'd be okay on that. Really eight hours is best. Far from large trees, uh, even if you have a container and you're, and you're sitting on the ground somewhere, 
tree roots are going to find it. I absolutely guarantee you those tree roots can search out uh, the high nutrient uh, content of your potting soil, and they're going to get that way while uh, your plants have the nutrients down the water. Microclimates. One side of the balcony can really be different from the other side of the balcony. We're talking about wind gusts and the actual sun and temperature variations, it can really change. It's amazing. I have planted identical plants within like eight feet of each other in the garden. Oh, this is perfect. You know, this is a perfect spot. One fails, the other thrives. And it's just a little difference in the sun, a little bit difference in the water, the soil, or the wind, or whatever. So consider everything uh, when you're picking your location. If possible, rotate your plants so that you're not creating a reservoir of disease. Uh, this is Florida. It's, you know, it, there's just tons and tons of fungi and, and other diseases that accumulate in the, in the soil uh, and you want to change. And that's the same for container gardens as well. Um, some uh, gardens with this new trend is edible landscaping. Uh, we're not going to really talk about that. Uh, that's another topic. But uh, uh, integrating edible plants into your regular landscaping beds. Uh, it's something I do uh, on a limited basis. Again, sometimes there's uh, HOA restrictions, but it's still a uh, nice approach. Decide whether you have the space for, for a raised bed or you're just going to go containers. There's a lot of advantages to containers, and you can grow just about any vegetable in a container. A little problem with potatoes and some other root vegetables, but really you can, you can do just about anything you want in a container. And then make a plan. Uh, and I'm going to hit this again and again. Do a soil test. Do a soil test. Do a soil test. We do the pH testing uh, here at the extension right around the corner for $2. Uh, for $10, you can send a sample off to the university lab in Gainesville, and they do a full nutrient profile of your soil. Sometimes that's valuable even if you're using commercial potting soil, because you may not know exactly what the nutrient capacity is of that soil. Uh, but the, that profile will tell you exactly what you have in soil. But the most critical aspect of your soil health and productivity for your plants is that pH. If you're outside the normal pH range, the nutrients that are there aren't available to the plant. So sweet spot is like 6.5, which is slightly acidic. And that's kind of characteristic of most of the soils that we have in, in this part of uh, Central Florida. But it's still good to do a test. Okay, make a plan. I uh, pulled up a, a nice little planner off of uh, Amazon. Uh, there's a, a number of, of aspects, but really take the time to think about what you're going to do, what you want, what results you want, what your resources are, and use this for year over year, season over season, keeping track of what did well in this spot, what variety of tomato did I plant that really did good and I liked and enjoyed, uh, and what problems you had, what sort of pests you had, what you did to treat them and how effective that was. Doesn't have to be elaborate, just a quick scheme of your raised bed or, or just what you planted in your containers. Growing seasons. We have three basically in Florida, which is kind of a surprise to newcomers that are, that are new to the state. Spring, February to June, your warm season plant uh, plantings. And one of our handouts will be um, what, that, what that means in terms of planting cool and warm season. Um, planting. Um, uh, then summertime, by the time we get into June, most everything that you planted in the spring is fading. There are a few plants uh, that do okay in the, in the heat of the summer. Um, uh, Seminole pumpkin I'm growing right now and I'm just uh, coming into harvest time. That's a really good option. Uh, char, Swiss chard and a few others do okay with heat. But mostly, uh, most people kind of let the garden rest uh, for, the, for the heat. The evidence of getting to the fall right now is, uh, is the ideal time. So if you're looking to start uh, your garden uh, with the seeds that you get here, this is the perfect time to plant. Uh, good through March. Um, there are some cold season uh, plants that are going to overwinter and, and do okay. And some plants that, that fade away will come back again in the spring. If you are starting from seed, uh, some plants like tomatoes. If you have tomato seed, you're really a little late. Uh, you should have started like a month ago uh, for transplant. Uh, but we'll talk about some of that more in detail as we go by. Here's the chart. Uh, one of the best <coughs> handouts I'm going to have for you is the Florida Vegetable Garden Guide this year. 
and has a number of tables that are very useful. This is one of them that shows when to plant, how, how soon to expect, you know, fruiting and harvest and that sort of thing. And then the transplantability take long, right? You have three categories. Category one is transplants, you know, very rarely. So if you buy a plant uh, in uh, Lowe's or Depot or whatever, uh, like a tomato or a pepper farm, you start with the seed and transplant it, no problem. Category two is if you're really, really careful, you know, you can transplant it. And then category three is really start from seed uh, directly into the ground. Uh, I have a couple of mistakes here. Carrot really is you know, category three. Uh, they don't transplant too well. But, uh, that's an older thing. So here's uh, one of the uh, charts we have available online uh, on uh, the EDIS, which is our um, database of university produced articles. Uh, telling you for September, here's the sort of things that, that you can expect to, to do well planting right now. All stuff that's widely available. Okay, crop selection, cultivar matters. When you go out and, and see a tomato plant in Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever, there's going to be six or eight or more different varieties. It really does matter the type that you pick. And in the uh, one of the charts in the handout there will show the most suitable, most successful varieties of, of the major plants uh, that we grow here in Florida. Um, Heirloom varieties will jump ahead. Uh, some work well, some don't. Most of the successful vegetables here in Florida are, are hybrids. That means they've been developed by crossing with other various varieties, and they do very well because they've been bred to do well here. Uh, one thing about your seed exchange, when you take a seed from a hybrid, it doesn't necessarily probably won't breed true. So it's going to have different characteristics than the original seed which you bought. Heirloom varieties generally will breed true. So if you have an heirloom tomato that you really like and it did well, keep the seeds and you can plant those and it's going to be fine. Some chance of cross-pollination. Uh, so it's, it's never certain, but that's, that's the thing. Check out the table, see when, uh, when the best planting time is, how long it takes to, to germinate, how long it takes to fruit, and when you can expect the harvest, and then plant yourself for it. Rotate uh, your crops again. Think about planting in succession. So if you're growing something uh, like lettuce and you get a big packet of you know a bazillion seeds in there, you know plant a few this week. Wait a week or so, plant a few more. Wait a week or so, plant a few more. So if you have a succession of uh, harvestable fruit or harvestable product, and you're not inundated with you know a half acre of lettuce all at once. Um, and if your favorite variety uh, fails, try something else. That's another reason to keep that, that journal. Just keep your track of what you're doing. Uh, there are a variety of seeds. You do need to do a bit of research, uh, whether you're buying from a seed catalog or even locally. Uh, you go into Lowe's and Pico, they get seeds generally that uh, are given to them directed by the central office. Most of them we found are suitable for Florida, but some are not. Uh, some of the plants that you get, some of the tomatoes and stuff you buy, are not really suitable for this location. So do a little bit of research and make sure that what you're getting is something that's suitable for you. Okay, here's table two uh, from the handout. A good example is Bush Lake, uh, Bush Blue Lake beans, either the vining type or the bush type uh, does really well. I plant these every year and get a bumper crop. Really good option here, and this is a great reason to go to this table. Take it with you, maybe, or have it on your phone. Uh, check it out when you're picking out uh, the seeds in, in the, either either here or, or at a store. Um, gives you a little uh, idea on how they how they produce. One thing, a uh, difference between, in this case, bush bean is what we call uh, determinate, which means most of the fruit comes right at the same time. So this is perfect if you're going to do uh, freezing or canning, but if you're looking for sustained production uh, through the season, then you want to go with the cold type, because uh, that's indeterminate. That means it's continually 
um, blooming and fruiting throughout the season. Okay, soil plant and nutrition. Again, soil test. Do the soil test. Uh, make sure that what you have is going to be suitable for the plant that you're growing. Most vegetable crops, sweet spot is like 6.5, like I said. Anything from, from really even 5.5, but really more like 6 to 7 uh, is really ideal for uh, getting all the nutrients that are available in the soil. Long-term process to, to improve. If you're looking to start a, a um, garden, particularly if it's in ground, it's going to take you a few years to develop that soil to the point where it's really, really healthy and productive. Um, if you're using a container, buy, buy a commercial mix. You know, if it's going to be ideally suited for growing the, the product that you want. Uh, we do have recipes for making your own potting soil. Uh, I can give you the reference to that uh, at the end, or if anyone has a question. Uh, but really, they're not much better than, you know, you're, you're pretty okay going with it. just about any commercial uh, variety. It does take time. Um, you want to look at your nutrient profile. Um, our Florida soils, if you're doing the sandy soil, really there's not much there. Uh, so you're going to have to do some amendments, you know, adding of the uh, compost or other organic matter um, for a variety of reasons. But looking at the nutrients, you look at a bag of fertilizer, you have like 10, 5, 10, something like that. That's nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are your three key macronutrient nutrients. The plants need a lot of that. Others are calcium, sulfur, um, magnesium. These are substances that the plants need in quantity. Micronutrients like uh, copper and manganese and uh, uh, a few others need uh, boron. Uh, the plants need them in very, very tiny quantities, but those quantities have to be there. They're absolutely still essential to the plant growing, which is another reason why, particularly if you're doing any ground planting, you might want to do the big soil test from the university to get an idea of what's in the soil. Organic versus inorganic uh, fertilizers. Uh, again, we have recipes for homegrown, homemade fertilizers. Uh, or the, the organic stuff that you find out there, commercially, is mostly good. There's advantages and disadvantages to both uh, chemical fertilizers and uh, organic fertilizers. But that's the subject of a whole other class to answer questions specifically. But chemical fertilizers give you control over precise amounts and availability of the nutrients that you're that you're adding to your soil. So if you want to be accurate to the plant's needs, you know, there's nothing wrong with a chemical fertilizer. The plants don't care because the availability, when the, the form of the nutrients that are available to the plant are both the same. So when you add organic nutrients, those nutrients are not immediately available to, this, to the plant. Bacteria in the soil have to convert it to an available form. So, you know, a, a nitrate form of nitrogen is going to be the same whether it comes where it's derived from organic or inorganic. The difference is, you know, the chemical versions are salts and they can build up in soil. If you're over fertilizing with those, you can cause problems. On the other hand, the organics are not as nutrient dense, so you have to add a lot more of them and a lot more frequently. But we can talk about that more as it's going. Read the label, it's the law, and it's really, really critical. Uh, thinking that, you know, if, oops, thinking that um, adding a little bit more is going to be more beneficial to the, to the plant, it's not, and you can end up doing more harm than good. So do read the label. Soil health, again, pH, can't stress this enough, always do that. The amount of organic matter, uh, in the soil, uh, the composition and the structure of the soil improve over time as you as you are cultivating crops there. Um, you want to check the nutrient profile of your soil again. Micronoids, microorganisms from microscopic to you know macro critters, worms and, and insects all add to the overall health of your soil. They're all they all have roles. In your soil. If your soil is barren 
of these organisms, it's not healthy and it's not going to contribute to uh, successful growth. Till versus no till, um, not so much an issue with your container gardening, but if you have a raised bed or you're in, in ground thing, I really encourage you to disturb the soil as little as possible because that structure really does develop over time particularly the mycorrhizal fungi, which some of you may have heard. These are fun, fungus organisms that grow throughout the soil. They send a little mycelium, the fibers, in a symbiotic relationship with most plants. They provide water and facilitate providing water and nutrients to the plant. The plant, in turn, normally will provide them with Finished, finished product of carbohydrates. So it's a mutually beneficial uh, arrangement and a healthy soil is going to have this stuff just throughout and rampant. The, the, least, the less you can disturb the soil, the more um, thoroughly developed that mycorrhizal network is. And look at the history as well. If you're doing an in-round, you might want to check and see what came before. A lot of times, build, if you're on a lot, Builders dump God knows what you know soil uh, there before you don't really know what's there. Unfortunately, most of the soil testing we can't test for um, contaminants like heavy metal and stuff. You would have to go to a to a commercial lab uh, if you're really concerned about that. The soil food web again. Um, this is a picture of the mycorrhizal network. Those little uh, mycelium fibers. Uh, connect both externally and internally with the roots of the plants and conduct that exchange of nutrients and water. Uh, really important. Bacteria, uh, protozoans, nematodes, good and bad. Uh, and there are good nematodes that are really valuable uh, as uh, predators against bad stuff and uh, you know, developing uh, their portion of that soil food with. But the main problem for us is there are bad nematodes that are going to you know, do bad things to your soil. But we, that's another class in the end, and we can talk about how to deal with nematodes if you have a problem like that. Seeds and transplants. Look for seeds of good quality. Buy from a good source, or make sure that you're checking out what, what's available in your seed bank. If you're getting it from neighbors, ask them questions about what, where it came from. Buying seeds commercially, just be aware some of them are coated with various treatments to protect them from fungal diseases when the plant is young. Uh, there's a fungal issue called damping off, which if, you, if you've lost a seedling, that's probably what happened, is that fungus attacks the seedling when it's, when it's most vulnerable, when it's young and tender, and it just dies. Uh, so some seeds are, are treated to deal with that. Check uh, if the seed is for the current growing season. Most seeds really are only good for a year. If you refrigerate them and protect them carefully, maybe you get another season or two out of it. Uh, they're still good in a way, but the um, germination rate is gonna fall off dramatically. So you might plant 10 seeds and get one plant. So always check the date, and make sure you have something fresh. Uh, consider the transplantability guide, uh, you know, whether you wanna start something from seed or directly sow in the ground. Um, if you're buying a transplant from a nursery or the store, you know, check the bottom of the little container and see if, if the roots are really coming out strong. It's probably plant a, a root bound and you may want to check around and find that's one that's a little fresher, a little newer. Check the stems, check the leaves, look for signs of disease. Little spots on the leaves could indicate fungal infection. Check for insects, uh, check for weeds in the, in the pot. I'm sorry. Yeah. Did you say you should see the? No, uh, you should not. You should not. You don't want one that has a lot of right. roots coming okay. out because okay. that's going to be okay. plot bound. Okay. If that's all you get, that's fine. I'm not buying myself. Okay. It's just when you plant, make sure you tease the roots away from that root ball. You know? If you don't, the roots will continue to just wrap around. They're not going to move into the surrounding soil, and they're just not going to grow. So at least that's uh, if you do start from seed, uh, it's an easy process, and I have a handout uh, to help you with that uh, process. Uh, it's it's really fairly easy, but you you have to pay attention. You have to make sure that your growth medium stays moist. You have the right amount of light uh, until they're ready to transplant. And I mentioned the seeds that are 
that are green. If your seed is colored, like it's pink, and there's a common color that they use to mark to show that it's been treated, uh, just be cautious with it because that some of those substances can be toxic. So you want to keep them away from pets, and, and you don't want to handle them and then eat something that's or whatever. Okay, here's a good example of what to look for uh, on a seed packet. Um, all the information you need for planting is right there. These, uh, this is an older picture. You know, I mean, didn't see the need to update. Pack for pack for the 2016 season. So if you have uh, you see this in the store and it's 2017 or 2018, you know it's really a little too late for that seed. You will get some production from it, but like I said, you can only get like you know 20% germination. Tells you everything you need to know, planting depth, planting space, um, days to germination, uh, days to maturity, and details about how to, how to plant and where to plant, how to care for them. Okay, watering and irrigation, again, here's another another area I can, I have a class I can teach for a couple of hours on, it's very, can be very complicated. The problem for us in Florida for vegetable gardening is the rainy season doesn't necessarily correspond with the ideal growing season. So if you're planting that early season uh, crop in February, in February is the traditional age, you're going to have to add supplemental irrigation because we might need to be in the spring. So think about uh, that when you're making your plan. If you're growing just a few containers, no problem. I mean, it's kind of easy to hand water, but you have to remember to do that. So that's making a commitment. You can also set up automated uh, irrigation things, even for a small uh, system like a, you know, a couple of containers. Drip and, and trickle irrigation are the most you know, efficient. The idea is that that foliage doesn't need irrigation. You know, the roots need irrigation. And you want to get the water directly to the roots for, you know, to avoid waste, for one thing, and to avoid fungal infections. So wet foliage equals prime growing opportunity for fungal infections. You can't do anything about rain. When rain comes when it does, but we can avoid additional uh, stress by not spreading the foliage when we're when we are, um, irrigating. Uh, automated systems, like I said, are great, but particularly in rainy season. Don't set it, forget it. Don't be watering when we just had two inches of rain. So, you're going to overstress your, your soil and system and, and promote root rot, which is another problem. Uh, design it and calibrate it for the specific plant needs. Tomatoes have a different, you know, uh, water requirement than other plants, you know, whether you have beans or whatever. Think about the requirements for the specific plant you have. Consider your rainfall, consider the soil type, make sure it's well drained. Use of mulch, you know, can limit the amount of irrigation that you need to add. Uh, check your system out if you have an automated system. Don't assume that once you have it established that it's going to be fine. Uh, they, they get clogged, they get uh, you know, all sorts of glitches, uh, and the plant is going to grow. If you do have like a microspray, and it's fine for when the plant is just starting, it's going to be different from when the plant is big, and you could be have plants that are blocking each other. So check it regularly. Hand watering is always fine. Just got to remember to do it. Rain barrels are kind of a special case. Uh, you think, oh, rainwater, that's great. Problem is, that rainwater comes off your roof. And that's picking up bird poop and squirrel poop and, and uh, effluence from the, from the tile uh, shingles, uh, whatever you have. I use my rain barrel water for ornamentals mostly, just because of that, because you really don't know what pathogens, pathogens may have gotten in. Um, reclaimed water, the short answer, no. Um, the university did studies on uh, several reclaimed water systems around. It, the problem is, uh, although they're mostly very well treated, there are pathogens that could still be in there. There are heavy metals that could be in there. There are pharmaceuticals that could be in there, and those are not tested for. So the end result was that if you're, if you're careful and only water in the root zone, and that never gets on the foliage, never gets on the fruit, it can be okay to use irrigated, uh, to use reclaimed water. I don't, and I really recommend that you don't, because you just never know what's in there. Fine for your ornamentals, fine for your lawn, but really reclaimed water is not good for you. 
for your vegetables. And again, the amount of water is going to vary it's by season, by the weather, by the conditions, by you know what you have. If you have mulch or not, if you have prepared soil, if you have a lot of organic matter, as sand. So gauge what you need according to those conditions. Here's a couple of examples. Uh, top left, that's a bubbler. Uh, that's great for container gardens. If you have a system that you can set that up with and do it on a regular basis, that's a perfect way to get water right to the root zone. No danger of splashing or spreading uh, fungal spores. Top right, that's more of a commercial thing. You've got a PVC feeder, poly tube um, extenders, and then they have a little drip stuff there. This is kind of a weaker hose. It's a, a thin tube without a pencil. Uh, like you string that along your garden and it has the little weaker holes and regular intervals. This is what I use. Uh, you got a poly tube with um, uh, little rubber tubes that come off. This is an emitter that you can get in various sizes, different flow rates, which is great for a container garden, great for a raised bed, which is what I have. Um, and you can adjust that and adapt it uh, and change it really easily as, as time goes by and your needs change in the garden. And also with that, uh, you can get a micro spray. Uh, these are cool. You can just get them to any uh, you know angle of spray and a little bow to adjust the amount of flow. IPM, integrated pest management. This is one of our key aspects of uh, managing pests and, and the extension. This is the balanced use of all the different uh, methods for controlling your pests at the lowest level of impact, the lowest level of toxicity, and the cheapest way. Uh, if you're taking notes on, I am going to make this available to, uh, to your, uh, for your use in a, in a PDF. So, um, Pest diseases and weeds. The idea is use your cultural practices first. So when you're looking to control weeds, put some mulch down. You know, do some hand weeding on a regular basis. Uh, a recent study I just looked at from the university compared uh, the timing. Uh, so if you do weeding once a week and pull them up when they're fairly uh, you know, immature and easy to pull, versus like once a month, it's actually, you know, far, far less effort overall if you do it once a week than if you wait and just do it once a month because those weeds are established then, they're producing seeds, they're harder to pull up. Uh, so hand weeding is great. Think about the damage threshold. That's the amount of damage that you find acceptable. So how many weeds do you find you know, are acceptable? How many aphids on your you know, tomato plant do you find acceptable? You're going to lose a certain amount of product versus using chemical or other controls that maybe you're not comfortable with. But that's your decision. You decide at what point you have to escalate your treatment regime to deal with those pests. Scouting, very important. If you're growing vegetables, whether you have a single tomato plant in a pot, check it on a regular basis. Look under the leaves, look at the surface of leaves. Look for little spots that show uh, fungal infection maybe starting. Look for those aphids and other chewing and sucking uh, insects. Nip it in the bud, so to speak. Start you know your treatment plan where it's going to be early and regular basis, so that you have less damage. But it's how much damage you're willing to accept. Biological controls. Um, there really are a lot, and I'll show you some examples of beneficial insects that are out there, along with the bad guys, and they're taking control of them. You will never reach a point where the beneficial insects are going to take complete control of the of the pest insects, and that's a logical thing. If they eat them, if they take care of all of them, they no longer have a food source, and they're going to die or they're going to go away. So it's it's a balance that's reached. If that balance is acceptable to you, then just look for those beneficials and try not to treat too much the you know the chemicals that are bad insects because you're going to kill the good insects. Biorational is the new buzzword. We're looking at lower impact kind of uh, insecticides like insecticidal soap, horticultural oil, uh, neem oil, uh, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, the BT is a product which you'll see, uh, spinosad, which is another uh, organic 
right, insecticide that deals with caterpillars and stuff, other chewing insects. Go with those first. Chemicals should be your last resort. There are chemicals that are suitable for vegetable gardening, and uh, if we can help you select those, uh, that would be a problem. Okay, so uh, organic is a way to go. Uh, I try to be as organic as I can, but I don't hesitate. You know, if I need to go uh, with something stronger to do, uh, and we can help you with uh, selecting those as well. Lots of one side um, uh, line resources. Here's the key. If something is not eating your plants, you're not part of the ecosystem. I like to consider my garden is part of the ecosystem. So I planted uh, a big muscadine mine and uh, built myself a nice little arbor. And the first year that it really produced had tons and tons and tons of grapes, just huge uh, produce. I was testing them daily as it came close to, to uh, harvest and said, oh man, I think tomorrow they're just going to be perfect. Well, the raccoons thought that as well. So that night, every single grape eaten off that, that vine. Try harvesting earlier the next year. You just, you just you know, try making some jam. It just wasn't very good. So I just said, okay, guys, this is my contribution to your uh, continued survival, and we love the raccoons. So, you know, it's doing my part for the ecosystem. Here's some of your major pests. Uh, most common, you're going to see the aphids, you're going to see mealy bugs, uh, very, very common. You can deal with these with the low impact horticultural oil or insecticide soap. These are organic products, and I encourage you to use them. Um, mites, uh, almost microscopic, uh, need a little different, but the same product can take care of them. Uh, caterpillars, the best treatment of those are those products I mentioned, BT or um, spinosad, S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D. Uh, again, these are organic products based on uh, naturally occurring bacteria in the soil, and they do a great job. But they, they kill the good that, that uh, caterpillars too, so. Um, I sometimes have heard of neem oil to use. Neem for oil, this. neem oil is good. It is a type of horticultural oil. The advantage of neem oil is it also has a mild antifungal aspect too. And in fact, they, there are varieties of that where they concentrate that antifungal uh, element and use it as a fungicide as well. So neem oil is a great, great oil. Uh, nematodes, really the only practical means of dealing with nematodes is to solarize your garden. So between seasons, particularly in that, that heat of the summer, clear plastic over the ground for three, four, or you know, longer weeks. Uh, will um, heat the soil to a high enough temperature that it dries the nematodes down far enough that you're going to get a couple of seasons uh, where they're not, uh, you know, effective. Uh, but you can't really get rid of them. There's no good chemical treatment for them. Uh, diseases, uh, just an example of, of one of the more common fungal diseases, anthracnose. There's plenty. This is for, there's just tons of different things. Uh, Cercospora. Uh, our malaria, there's, there's a ton of different fungal diseases, but for most of us, the treatment is the same for the variety, for whatever variety of um, fungus you get. Because the fungicides are mostly broad spectrum, they're suitable for use on vegetable gardens, uh, and they're going to take care of most of these. But if you need to, we can help you with them. Blossom enron is not really a disease, it's a, it's a, it's a physical uh, nutrient deficiency. So that comes mostly from a lack of calcium. But ironically, most of our soils have plenty of calcium, but the pH, if it's off, they, the plants can't get to that calcium. They can't absorb the calcium, and so you get the shortage. So testing that pH calcium is really important. Uh, leaf spots, um, mildews, root frost, these are all different fungal infections. So again, scouting is very important. Just if you catch them early enough, you can treat them and not have a real issue with the problems. Beneficial insects. Uh, these are the ones you want to look for. These are the ones that are going to be hunting your aphids and your, your mealy bugs and your others, and they can take care of a lot of them. But again, you have to decide how much damage you're willing to accept. Some other beneficials, 
sliders. I have a particular love for sliders, so I don't know if that's odd or not. A good example of, of targeted predator prey relationship mealybugs and the mealybug destroyer, which is the larva of a moth. Uh, they look kind of similar, even so. Uh, so be careful when you're looking for these. If, you're, if, you're not, if you see a lot of these mealybug destroyers, they're going to take care of a lot of those mealybugs. So just think twice before you treat. Because uh, whatever you treat, uh, it's going to kill both. Spiders, these, these guys are great in your garden. <laughs> try, try to think positively about them in your home because they're really helpful. I like spiders. OK, some alternatives. This is just one example of hydroponics. You can scale this to any level. So you have a, a small patio or a balcony in your apartment. You can scale this to um, any size. Basically, this is just a metal, a wood framework, uh, plastic, and some styrofoam. You can get these little um, growing cups online, very, very cheap. Plant your, plant your seedling or a transplant, or you can plant your seeds in there. Um, we have instructions uh, on how to uh, set up and establish your nutrient uh, flow in the water. And you just pour some holes that are the same size as the, as the cup, put them in, plop your styrofoam down in the water, and you're good to go. Some plants are more suitable for hydroponics. Uh, we start out a class using a five-gallon bucket uh, and poking a couple of holes in it and grow lettuce and other leafy vegetables. These are the most commonly done. Great way to start and learn uh, some of the basics about it. It's fun and it's really, really easy to set up. And once you set it up, it just, you know, forget. You know, you, you just let it grow. You don't really have to do anything. You don't have to add water. You don't have to add nutrients. Uh, once you set it up, it's good to go. Lots of resources. Uh, this is Hannah Wooten. She's uh, used to be with us at uh, Seminole. Now she's at Orange. Um, she has a, a neat class that you can access online um, with that link there. Uh, it takes a five-gallon bucket, and there's the results. And you just plop this stuff in there, and you stick it out in the sunny spot uh, outside, and let her go and harvest when you're ready. It's really, really easy and a lot of fun. Uh, we do this a lot with uh, school kids. Containers, okay, this is mostly uh, what we're interested in here. A little extra maintenance. Uh, some plants, in a, as we get down to a freezing temperature, if they're in ground, they're going to survive. But if they're a container, they're a little more vulnerable. So if we get close to freezing weather, you want to bring those in to the shelter the spot. Uh, you're going to have to hand water or set up some sort of micro irrigation. And if you're hand watering, you got to remember to do that on a regular basis. Because if you let them go, some of these plants are really vulnerable to drought. And if you let them get too dry uh, for a too long time, they're just going to drop. Change the soil. The recommendation of, from UF and IFITS is you know, at least every three years, for really, in most places in Florida, you really want to do every year put new soil in there. It's not that expensive, and you're going to have a lot better results. These spores from fungi and other diseases can accumulate in the soil, and they get depleted as well. Don't overwater. Easy to do. Um, containers, you think, oh my God, it's, it's dry. I'm going to add a gallon of water to the thing. If it's not draining well, you're going to get your um, And don't put too many in a pot. Say a five gallon container is great for one tomato plant, maybe. Uh, Beans and other stuff, you know, you can maybe crowd a little more, but just experiment and, and think about it, not trying to do too much in one pot. Uh, good drainage is, is important. A lot of pots you buy are not going to have those drainage holes. Very easy to add, even a ceramic pot, just get a masonry bit, going to pop right through there, drain hole. Something down the bottom uh, to keep the soil from flowing out. I use old bits of uh, window screen. Uh, you can use just about anything, styrofoam bits or, or rocks or whatever. Uh, commercial blends are really pretty good uh, that you get. You can hardly go wrong with commercial blends of potting soil. Don't use topsoil. Don't use anything you know from, from your you know, garden stadium, from the garden. You really need a potting soil that's going to drain well. Uh, 
Uh, and most of them are going to have a bit of nutrients in them to start. We have recipes for homemade. Uh, it's fairly easy, but you know, uh, it's going to cost you just about as much when you buy the ingredients or obtain the ingredients. Uh, so nothing wrong with the uh, commercial blends. Use a complete slow-release fertilizer is your best bet. The ideal is a granular product with at least like 65% slow-release nitrogen, which you can find on the label. If you're using uh, liquid, um, probably going to have to do that every two weeks for most containers. With uh, most regular granular, like once a month, but if you use the slow release, then once and done. Here's an example of uh, limited space. Here's a balcony, uh, making use of all your vertical and horizontal space. Can be done. Uh, so we, I think this is from Germany. It's a little, just a pull from wherever. Uh, here's an example of a, a little more elaborate than we're you know, probably going to do. This is uh, Epcot's Flower Garden. Thanks, Disney. Uh, really cool. Uh, using kind of found by things. Go vertical. Think about uh, alternates. Here's a guy that used um, drink containers, plastic drink containers. You can cut them out, put drainage hole in, popped in his um, body soil, and made some uh, wood rockets. Works for Go vertical. All sorts of options. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly what those are, but uh, they're cloth things with little pockets. I've seen people use uh, uh, stuff for shoes, you know, shoe tree sort of thing. Uh, lots, lots of possibilities. If you do go with a raised bed, you can buy the easiest route is to go with a kit. Uh, of course, that, that's expensive uh, for some, but you can use uh, just about any any old lumber or um, other stuff. Different possibilities. Here's one I uh, caught a couple weeks ago at Lowe's. You buy the little bricks, uh, sort of ceramic blocks, and flip and wood cut to whatever size you want to do, slide them in, and you got your garden. Another couple of examples from uh, Disney.com. Uh, you can create and use of your cinder blocks. Uh, just the TP style is great for binding stuff like beans and, and other stuff grapes. And here's something I would really like to for you to consider is a community garden. Uh, universities, colleges have a lot of space. If you if you can find someone to help sponsor that for you, uh, this is a great opportunity for those that don't have space elsewhere to get together, combine the resources, um, and, uh, and grow some nice vegetables. Introduce uh, the people to gardening, uh, bring together just from the social aspect. A lot of fun. We do sponsor a lot of these. Uh, like I said we have some in uh, hospitals uh, and uh, elementary and middle schools around the town. Um, it's a lot of fun for the students. And that's about it. Um, think these things through first. Think about your resources. Think about your location. Think about uh, the amount of time uh, that you're willing to devote to. Uh, to grow them, whether it's a single pot or a raised bed or, or whatever. Um, do some research. Keep track year to year of what works and what doesn't. What works well best in this spot, which type of plant and stuff. And, you know, have a great time. And I'm ready for any questions if you have. Here's the list of resources. The star ones uh, have handouts here. I would encourage you, if you're at all interested, to get the vegetable handbook. Lots of good information there. And for those starting the seeds, uh, we have a handout on that. There's a lot of details on how it does. Anyone that's interested in the Master Garden program, here's for one of our Pretty sure you already answered my question. I'll answer it again. Sorry, but uh, yeah. any idea of how to deal with deer? Because it's okay. my front lawn has been a problem lately. Yeah, um, my uh, my lot is back on the conservation area, and it was actually a game trail, and the deer still come through every night. So there are deer repellents, like you're sucking on the black egg, some hydrogen sulfide kind of stuff. 
If you spray plants regularly, assuming that the plant tolerates it, that will discourage deer over time, but you have to do it pretty regularly. There aren't a lot of other options. I mean, uh, I've seen people that use the spray push system with the motion detector. You know, those can be effective. Um, my vegetable garden, I just put a, a white wire fence around it. And the deer could leap over it, but they're too dumb to realize that they're doing it. So they don't necessarily. Like, you, can't get, you really can't keep the raccoons out. You can't keep the, the armadillos out. You can't keep the possums out. You're going to have to accept that you're going to lose a certain amount of your produce to, to the critters. Yeah. All right, Seminole State family, um, before we pop back to the q and A, I I do want to thank everybody for joining us in the stream or on the replay. Once again, we are going to post links uh, to the um, in the description box to all the resources that go along with Bob's presentation and um, also the Seed for Thought uh, library here in the um, uh, library, in the Sanford Lake Mary Library. So I think we're about to go downstairs, but let me pop back. I'll pop back the Q&A and see uh, if they have some more questions. Yeah. That's a special, yeah, that's a special circumstance. In most commercial greenhouse, folks are gonna wanna limit um, that I, I, there are um, chemical treatments for spiders. Uh, so is it a bad thing I had an overabundance? No, I, it depends on the spider. It depends on your tolerance of things. They're not going to do any harm to the plants. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these spiders are insectivores. You know, so they're going after insects. And really, a an overabundance of spiders is normally a signal that you have a lot of insects in there preying. So myself, I would see that as a positive. You know, I would like to have those spiders that are taking care of those bad bugs that are going after my plants. So, sir. Um, does any of your advice apply to the mushrooms? So mushrooms, uh, we don't. Uh, <laughs> I, I seldom get questions on mushrooms except how to get rid of them. Uh, so growing, are you talking about growing mushrooms? Growing mushrooms. Yeah. Um, don't have a lot of experience on them. So <laughs> what I would say is, uh, have our contact information here. Give us a call at the help desk, uh, and I can I can do some research and get you information about it. And on that, okay. So the reference here, uh, EDIS, E D I S. That's our document repository from all research-based products from IPAS. Great source of information. You go there and do a search on any of your plants, any of your diseases, any of your problems. You're going to find a wealth of information. There are gaps because we can't, they don't cover everything. So there are plants that may not be covered well. Here's a hint if you haven't done that, I would imagine most of you are aware of that. But if you're doing your Google search, type in site colon edu as your first term, then whatever your search term is, you're going to get only products from university research based uh, information. A uh, great way to weed out the stuff. Tons of information online, there are gardening groups, there are Facebook pages, but a lot of it is crap. I just really, there's, there's so much bad stuff out there. I really encourage you to contact us or do that, you know, uh, add that little search term there to make sure the information you're getting is science-based, research-based, uh, improved. Um, for mushrooms, there's a, a local mushroom farm that Wow. And he does classes and loves talking about it, loves mm -hmm. taking people on hikes to ID edible mushrooms in, in the forest and things like that. And I can write that up there too. So that mm -hmm. get that information. Yeah, that's um, awesome. Growing say, mushrooms is a whole other right. Did mention, you know, we have a YouTube channel uh, and our Facebook page. You can go there and find recordings of most of the classes that we've done over the years. Uh, there are some mushrooms. Uh, and the University of Florida has those online. Um, you can also check out Alachua County, uh, Hernando County, and Pasco County are three that do a lot of the online training and have all those classes recorded on their pages. So great, great source of information. Well, okay. well thank you all for coming. Oh, yeah. How do you deal with white flies? White flies? Oh, those are... Those are a perennial problem. Um, catching them in the larval stage is best. Uh, 
cultural aspects, uh, removing, not making uh, the conditions conducive to them, but particularly if you get them like on the inside plants and stuff, um, there are several ways to treat them dependent on the plant. Um, some people do a whole immersion sort of thing for house plant, and that takes for a lot of them. But horticultural oils and insecticidal soaps are generally the best way. You can also use uh, sticky traps, you know, like the pest no pest strips, whatever they call them, the little sticky things. Those are pretty good for white flies. And there's some other options. Uh, I would encourage you to go to uh, to our EDA site, type in white flies, and uh, get a bunch of other possibilities. And that's Okay. Can we have another uh, question at the front? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you mentioned the old time of just check your pH, right? Yeah. However, if it's out of range, what do you do? Because right. I imagine it's not good to just start dumping brine nutrients. Um, the acids. Well, you know, like strong acids or strong right. acids. It's fairly easy to raise the pH of your soil, so you just add lime. Okay. And the amount of lime we can you can calculate by sending the soil sample band to the university lab. They will give you a buffering component, which tells you how resistant the soil is to raising the pH. And will tell you then how much pH, how much lime you need to add to adjust the pH. The problem if you have um, alkaline soil is it's, it's very difficult to lower pH. And it's impossible to permanently lower pH. So you can add the best way to lower pH is elemental sulfur, agricultural grade sulfur. The bacteria in the soil convert that into sulfuric acid, and that's going to lower your pH. But the soil responds, you know, rebound fairly quickly. So it's this is something you have to do on a regular basis. But, uh, so, but that's that's really you, know, you can do it. You just have to do it you know, consistently. You know. Okay, so Little State family, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I did bet you didn't think you were gonna get a little mini mukbang here uh, during the stream. I'm actually drinking. I'm not. I'm eating a. It's called a froje. It's a frozen orange juice. I had some frozen cherries on top of this one, so it's a really great uh, vitamin C packed snack. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the OTG cam, the on the go cam, and go downstairs so that anybody watching on the stream or on the replay can see exactly where. The seed li seed for thought seed library cabinet is located in the Sanford Lake Mary uh, campus. Um, once again, in the description box, we're going to put the contact information for Bob and Carly and Linda, so that anybody with any questions, um, anything at all, you can get in contact with somebody. And um, don't forget, we have upcoming events: October thirtieth, follow up with the. Um, with the UF I, I FAS extension for gardening. So this is quite, as you can see from the presentation, it's quite an undertaking, but wow, what a payoff and how amazing would it be to have your own for your family and your neighbors? Because let's be honest, once it gets going, you're going to produce lots of food for your family, friends, and neighbors, organic food that you know exactly where it came from. You don't have to buy it. Yeah. It costs money to like do the gardening, but I mean, you know exactly where it's coming from. It's going to be fresh. Uh, you can can or like preserve or give away um, the extra. So like, how cool would that be? I'm really inspired. I have tried to garden before and I failed, um, but I didn't really apply all the different like procedures that like Bob went over, like really thinking about the watering and it takes time. It's an investment for sure. Um, but I'm re-inspired and I hope that others got inspired and, um, I'm looking forward to hearing about, um, what you guys, uh, get going in your own garden. So I'm going to go ahead and pop out of the stream and pop the OTG cam in and head downstairs and show you guys where the seed for thought library is. Okay.